Peter Kay and Jeremy Clarkson. Match wits with Jonathan Ross at 12.30. But first on BBC One, the Football League Show. Hello there with most of the Football League on FA Cup duty. Tonight we concentrate on the Championship, including the race to reach the Premier League. In fact, just to show you how tight things were at the start of the day, any team from 11th upwards could have ended the day in a playoff position. Well, Steve Claridge is with me to offer his views, and on the subject of views, Lizzie wants yours. Lizzie. Yep, it's almost all about the championship tonight. We've already heard from loads of Barnsley fans who started emailing me at 10 to 6 this afternoon. And if you don't know why, then keep watching. And also, good evening to Neil Warnock, who was bending my ear earlier today about not talking enough about Crystal Palace. Well, Palace fans, this is your chance. Text us on 81111 or send us an email to footballleague at bbc.co.uk. And remember, you can also send your questions in for Steve. What was that? Neil Warnock having a rant? Never. Anyway, here's what's coming up on tonight's Football League show. Leicester City of the surprise package of the season. Straight out of League One, the high-flying Foxes went to struggling Scunthorpe, who are just above the drop zone, but have seen off some of the league's best at home. No such worries for a Swansea team who are unbeaten in 11 and the form team in the Championship. They face a stiff test today, though. They're at leaders Newcastle, who've won their last four. And how can you be fallen up away from home after half an hour and still come away with nothing? We'll find out. Well, we start with the game involving two newly promoted sides who've had contrasting starts to the season. Scunthorpe have found the going tough, conceding more goals than anyone else in the league, while today's opponents, Leicester, started the day in third place, having lost just three of their 17 games so far. John Roder was at Glanford Park. League One champions Leicester have had an excellent campaign so far on their return to the championship, having lost just once in their last eight, while Scunthorpe, who came up via the playoffs, have lost their last four. But they have beaten Newcastle, Preston, Sheffield United and Derby here at Glanford Park this season. Scunthorpe goalkeeper Joe Murphy returns to the team, having been suspended for last weekend's 3-0 defeat at Watford. Marcus Williams comes in at left-back. Northern Ireland Internationals Grant McCann and Michael O'Connor start in midfield as Nigel Adkins makes four changes in all. Leicester captain Matt Oakley was suspended for last weekend's 1-0 victory over Plymouth. He's on the bench as Leicester field an unchanged starting 11. Andy King scored that late winner against Plymouth. Defender Jack Hobbs spent two months on loan at Scunthorpe from Liverpool in early 2008. You can see the flags fluttering slightly in the fairly stiff breeze. Conditions pretty good, though, for an afternoon of championship football in North Lincolnshire. Scunthorpe in the claret and blue, kicking from left to right in this opening half. Nigel Pearson hoping to extend his side's good recent run. Hit forward by Brown. Here's Fryatt. Picked up there by Richie Wellens, who will be a busy and important player for Leicester in midfield as he spreads that ball around. Forward here to Waghorn. Leicester with plenty forward already. Nice little touch back, and only just wide. Paul Gallagher, who made the run forward to make the uh, touch back. And the shot only just off target. Taken down wonderfully there by Martin Waghorn. It's Waghorn through, and Leicester get the opening goal. The man on loan from Sunderland gets his fourth of the campaign, and what an early strike for the Foxes. That's the touch from Waghorn that uh, took him away from the defender, Murphin, and a fine finish as well. Leicester strike first, Martin Waghorn with it. Really good, close control. And just able to poke it past the advancing goalkeeper. Dreadful start for Scunthorpe United. Nick 
corner infield as well. Wright couldn't make the most of it. And cleared away by Gallagher. Looking for Wackhorn on that far side. He's got Marcus Williams for company. Friatz in the middle. Forward by Nielsen. Wackhorn gets away from Hayes. King. Come again! Really good move from Leicester City. Jan Cormagant is yet to score for uh, Leicester. Met it firmly enough, but uh, the shot was almost straight into the ground. Nigel Pearson's team getting a rare first-half goal. 15 of their previous 20 in the championship this season have come in the second period. Hobbs finds Burner. Precise ball from the central defender. This is Fryatt. Wackhorn's in the middle. Fryatt will surely go for goal himself. Leicester asking for a corner and they've got one as well. No way that Matty Fryatt wasn't going to go for goal there. And it definitely gets a touch of the Scunthorpe man last of all. Gallagher to swing get it in. Get up, get up. Over from Kermagat. Away by Hobbs. O'Connor shrugs off Wellens. O'Connor was the target for the shot. Hayes fires it in. Scunthorpe get a corner. Rob Jones adding his considerable height to the Scunthorpe attack. Just over. That was a good corner kick. And it was Cliff Byrne who'd come forward from right back. Who rises high and his header is only just over. Brown. Looking for Fryatt, and that's a lovely curling ball from Wayne Brown. Fryatt puts it across. Header only as far as Nielsen. Driven back in towards Fryatt. There's a flag up on the far side. Stephen Smith, the assistant on the far side at uh, Glanford Park. Foul by Brown. On Hayes. There's plenty of space on the right-hand side there if Scunthorpe were able to exploit it. They go instead for the central ball, away by Hobbs. Returned by Wright. Hooper! Won't count. Flag up instantly on this near side. Nigel Atkins side, not back on level terms. Gary Hooper putting the ball into the back of the net. There's a clear push there on Nielsen. Wellens took that well on the chest. Wellens through to Matty Fryatt. Got a deflection, and that's a marvellous stop from Joe Murphy. Matty Fryatt denied his 11th goal of the season by the agility of the Scunthorpe goalkeeper. Leicester with yet another corner. They've forced plenty of them in this first period. Murphy goes for it, and is beaten to it as well. Away by Hayes in the end. Gallagher will win another corner kick for Leicester. Murphy coming out for this ball. And he was beaten in the air by Kermogan. Gallagher with the corner. This time Murphy comes and claims successfully and a quick release as well, looking for Hooper. Well, at 1-0 down, Nigel Atkins will surely believe that his team can find a way back into this match. Forward by Burner. Away by Murphy. Burner will take the throw. Not too much in the way of options. Goes for Fryat down that far side.
Wellens. Burner drives it across deep. Kermel Gant! Excellent save again from Murphy! Gunthorpe may have the leakiest defence in the championship, but in Joe Murphy to say they have a goalkeeper in top form. Hayes with a little touch forward, Hooper couldn't get there, Hobbs did. Maghorn beaten to it. Now Fryat, he's got in behind the Scunthorpe defenders. It's Matty Fryat bearing down on goal. Michael here to Waghorn. Desperate challenge from Williams, and Williams' challenge made all the difference there. Of course, the Scunthorpe defence all sorts of problems in the first half, and they've started as they've left off in the second period. And Brown nearly got the head up towards goal. Went wide from the central defender right burn he's Josh Wright McCann ships it in we all saw it all the way from Grant McCann Relatively easy for the Leicester goalkeeper. Jones hits it forward. Came off Gallagher. O'Connor. Here's McCann. Little touch from Hooper. Brings in Wolford on that far side. Martin Wolford trying to thread his way through and he's been fouled right on the edge of the penalty area. Grant McCann will take this free kick for Scunthorpe. Okay, curl it round the wall. Put it over the wall, over the bar as well. Ball was heading over. Nigel Pearson ordering his men forward. Comes off Steve Howard. Goal kick taken short. Leicester fans beginning to whistle now for the full time whistle from the referee. A few more seconds to play though. Thompson with a little header down. Leicester will try and scramble it clear, not too far. Wolford! And Martin Wolford has equalised for Scunthorpe right at the death. A punch in the air of celebration from Nigel Atkins. That goal means an awful lot for Scunthorpe United. Martin Wolford, who got both goals in the victory over Newcastle here earlier this season, has got an equally vital goal. Leicester unable to clear, only as far as Wolford, and despite the efforts there of two Leicester defenders, the ball evaded them both. And that is it. No more time to be played. Leicester City must have thought they were going to get all three points in their fourth away victory of the season. But Martin Wolford, the Scunthorpe substitute, had other ideas. And that could be a huge, huge point for Scunthorpe United. Full time at Glanford Park. Nigel Atkins' team have got a point. It is Scunthorpe United 1, Leicester City 1. It's uh, disappointing we should have been out of sight and um, I think that's the, uh, the biggest disappointment today is the fact that, uh, I mean really they didn't cause it any trouble at all throughout the game so um, we've only got ourselves to, to blame for not taking the three points. We've got a group of players who work very, very hard for each other. Uh, yes, we've, you know, we haven't had a good run of form away from home just of late, but I think it just epitomises the spirit that we've got in the camp, the heart that we've got in the camp, and we've been very successful over the last couple of years of, of doing that with a great team spirit. And uh, you know, we've got a small group and we work very hard for each other, and that's just been shown again tonight. Well, Martin, you left it very, very late. What is the mood like in that dressing room? Does it almost feel like a victory? Uh, yeah, it does, yeah. Uh, and I suppose in the other dressing room it'll feel like a loss to them, I mean, considered so late, but... Um, we just showed character, uh, the lads dug in, um, kept pressing and kept pressing and finally we got us uh, rewards at the end. It is disappointing to, to 
to drop two points so late in the game, but uh, I've taken on chin, I'm afraid. So Nigel Pearson won't dwell on that uh, result, which came right at the death end, didn't it? But that's another decent result for Scunthorpe, particularly at home. Yes, I mean, Scunthorpe, you, you get the feeling they're almost the, uh, the Burnley, aren't they, of the yeah. Championship. If they are going to stay up, it's probably going to be on the back of their home form. And uh, I think that, that, that game was a perfect example you know, of, uh, of the fighting spirit, the character that remains in the camp. And, you know, under a difficult circumstance, it has to be said, because they were second best for long parts of that game, they've managed to engineer something out of nothing. Do you think it will be their home form, perhaps, that could see them survive in this league? I think it will be, uh, ultimately, that will determine whether or not they stay up or not. And as I say, um, they have this, I think it's the second best record out of the bottom 12 sides. The bottom half, they have the second best record at home so far. So, if they keep that going, and they keep picking up their points, and they keep persevering like that, then, you know, you keep your fingers crossed, they'll be all right. Because definitely the brief before the start of the season yeah. is, we stay up. Sure. I mean, I know Martin Wolf had scored, but Hayden Hooper is certainly a threat for them up front. As for Leicester, however, it was a case of not taking their chances, perhaps. Uh, we think so, yes. I mean, probably five excellent chances in the first half, um, shared amongst probably two or three of the players. And now Matty Fright will be disappointed when you get on the, on the score sheet today. Uh, there were one or two times when, you know, you, you think he might have been a little bit sharp on occasions, but uh, it wasn't to be their day in front of goal. And what you've got to say is that, that they, they normally strangle the life out of teams in these sort of games. So, um, you know, all credit to, to Scunthorpe for keeping going. But when you say Newcastle, you see Newcastle and the likes of West Brom scoring goals left, right and centre. Yes. Should Leicester fans be worried that they can't get the same from their team? No, because they're not that type of side. You know, they're, 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 uh, you know they're, they're, there's two sides to, to Leicester's coin. You know, they are ultimately, they can, they can defend, they can take a lead early in games, and I think they can hold on to it. And they're also, you know, on, the, on their day... They're a good side going forward. They're very, very good on the counter-attack. So, no, you, you can't try and play the way that somebody else plays. You've got to play the way that suits you, and that's okay. what they do. Solid, if not spectacular. Absolutely. OK, well, like to St James's Park, then, where first met fourth as Newcastle took on an informed Swansea. It's no real surprise to see the Magpies challenging at the top, but Swansea's success has taken a few people by surprise. In fact, as Mark Clement found out, the fans are almost dreaming of a top-flight return for only the second time in their history. Swansea City may be starting the day in their highest position for 26 years, but they've still got a long way to go before they match the incredible exploits of John Toshak's legendary team. Having achieved promotion from Football League's bottom to top tiers in just four seasons under the current Welsh international manager, several times during the 1981-82 season, Swansea led the Division 1 table, beating Manchester United, Arsenal twice and drawing with Liverpool at Anfield. Eventually finishing sixth, the following year they were relegated and after their meteoric rise had an equally rapid fall. Fast forward 20 years, just as Newcastle with Shearer, Bellamy, Solano and co were finishing third in the Premiership and reaching the second stage of the Champions League, Swansea, after financial problems and much wrangling over their ownership, had to endure an end-of-season nail-biter against Hull to stay in the Football League. Do you ever think back to the dark old days of 2003 and think, you know, how different the destiny of your club could have been? Yeah, I think we all do that. I think that um, uh, thinking where we are now, yes, and looking back over those seven or eight years, it's a massive difference. And I hope all our supporters, which I, I know they do, can see the changes and appreciate it. Well, Paolo, you played for the great man at Sporting Lisbon, and here you are in his spiritual home. Uh, I hope he can be, it's with me all the time because I don't forget him, uh, he gives me a lot and I hope his spirit he can, he can be, he, it will be here uh, today all the time in this stadium because his son, um, he passed a lot of great times here. Sonus has got a pedigree and I think he's got a raw deal at Queen's Park Rangers and I think he's got, he's an absolute class act, totally class act, he's got everybody organised. We don't actually concede many goals. We've got flair, we've passed the ball, 11 games unbeaten. Any surprise that you're playing at a stadium like St James's Park today? No surprise to us, mate. We were, we, were in the, we were in Division 1 in the 80s, and this is where we belong, mate. Why are you dressed as penguins? Oh, it's just a random one, it was, for the Newcastle game, that's all. What are you most proud of, of, of what you've achieved this season? 
I think being top of the table at uh, th this stage of the season with um, coming into a division where we, we I suppose coming into the unknown as, as such um, problems that we had pre-season and a group of lads that have rallied together to, to be where we are now and um, I suppose at the start of the season if anybody was to say we would be, would be at the top at this stage we would have gladly settled for it. What's it been like this season? Have you been able to enjoy it? No, nah, it's been absolutely terrible football. There's been a few good games, but terrible football in general. But you're top of the league. That's not the point. Football's football, you can't watch a game. I came to so many games last year, and we drew most of them. And now we're winning them. It was bad going down, but I love coming to a Saturday, winning a match. You can't beat that. What a feeling. Beating one or two away matches, which haven't been very enjoyable, and one or two home matches, which haven't been too enjoyable, but uh, I'll be happier at five o'clock tonight we've got three points. This is a tricky match. The two in army should be happy enough after this performance against an informed Swansea side who've built a reputation for not conceding too many goals. Well, not before today anyway. The Swans were feeling generous, which was good news for goal star Marlon Harewood. The striker on loan from Aston Villa helps himself to an easy header after just eight minutes. Headers proved to be the Swans' Achilles heel in this one. A powerful run and a pinpoint cross from Jonas Gutierrez set up Peter Lovenkranz for his first goal since his return to the club in September on a permanent three-year deal. And having not scored in two months, Harewood added his second, Newcastle's third, before the half-hour. Lovenkranz the provider this time, a header of course. Swansea's record of having the most clean sheets in the division well and truly torn to pieces. Unbeaten in their last 11, the visitors tried to make a match of it. Steve Harper stayed alert in the Newcastle goal to keep out Cedric van der Gun's snapshot. And they were creating their fair share of chances. Newcastle looked casual at times and were almost punished by Andrea Orlandi. But again, Harper was on hand. The second half was tamed by comparison, but a powerful run from Lovencran set up Niall Ranger with the simplest of chances to make it four. But the youngsters wait for a first senior goal goes on. No matter, easy in the end for Newcastle. How are you? I'm good, how are you? You're going to come every week. You do know you're making this look easy, don't you? Um, this, nothing's easy in this, in this division. Um, we've, we've had the fight and scrap for, for, for everything that we've got. Um, uh, we scored our goals at a good time. And uh, in, in the period where we were playing well, uh, and I think that's the key, and, and that built confidence. To sustain it over 90 minutes is very difficult, particularly against a team that's uh, as, as in the form that, uh, that Swansea are in, uh, that, that never gave up. They had their chances uh, as well, and, and um, you know, amongst the goals we scored, we also needed our, uh, both our goalkeepers to make uh, vital saves at, at vital times. I suppose the one positive that can be taken out of this situation is your old mentor, Sir Bobby, will be looking down and there'll be a big smile on his face. Yes, it's, um, it's what I try to... Um, uh, to pass all this enthusiasm to our uh, to my players because um, you know it, we, we play good football after the the, the first 20 25 minutes after that we need to enjoy we need to play with that mentality winning mentality always with the smile of uh, Sir Bobby Robson well he doesn't look too downhearted after that defeat but are you surprised Steve at the ease with which Newcastle brushed aside Swansea there um well, yes and no. I mean, they, they, they've gone into that in great form, so I'm beating in 11. But Newcastle and, and West Brom at this stage look as if they're, they're a di different level to, to the other sides. And if they start well, Chris Hewton has for a high tempo. He got it, and the game, as you say, was over within 30 minutes. And, uh, you know, th there, was some, there was some good play as well. You know, they, they are, you can, it's easy to say, well, Swansea didn't, didn't get a grip of the game early on, but, yeah. but Newcastle were good as well, so give them credit. Yeah, and Marlon Hale particularly was good in front of yeah. goal. Two goals for him. Uh, no, it didn't quite happen for him, really, at Villa, but he has scored goals previously, of course, West Ham, yeah. at Nottingham Forest, where he started. Yeah. Uh, he could get a few goals at Newcastle. He could. I mean, I think, uh, certainly from a forward's perspective, you know, if you're playing in a poor side in the Premiership, and all of a sudden you come out of that and play in a good side in the Championship, certainly goals are going to be easier to come by, chances will be easier to come by. And I think not just Harewood, but Amiobi looks a different player. Carroll looks a good player. Uh, a decent player at this level. Yeah. So you, 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 you forwards are people who rely on their service. You don't get it in the Premiership, you don't score goals. You get it in the Championship, you're going to get goals. And I know Amiobi's closing in on his return, which could be very well timed yeah. too. Okay, well, let's hear from Lizzie now on the, the emails and texts front. Lizzie. 
Thanks, Manish. Well, first of all, I want to know if any of you watching spotted a certain young Premier League manager there in that Clem Swansea film. There's no prizes for guessing, but if you did, text an email in and give us the answer. Now, let's talk about Newcastle, because as always, we've had lots and lots of Newcastle fans getting in touch. Ronan, who calls himself an over-the-moon Magpie fan, I was really happy with our performance today and gave my cousin lots of stickers. He's an Owls fan. But Kenny says, today was lucky because our team has no natural goal scorers. We rely on midfielders like Nolan. Nolan, bring in Steve. Steve, do you fancy it? Oh, oh, <laughs> I, I, do you know what? I don't know a footballer. You must be crazy if, you, if there are any footballers who wouldn't fancy playing for, for Newcastle in front of those people. Mm, watch yeah. this face, Steve the Magpie. <laughs> uh, finally, uh, Richard, uh, who's a Scunthop fan, says, um, finally Scunthop score a vital goal in the dying minutes. Normally it's us who get ahead and lose out at the last. Well done, Joe Murphy. Robin says, I think Leicester need to sign a top-class finisher. Rossi, who's a Leicester fan, says, I can't believe we drew in the last minute, but at least we're still third. Aaron says, I think Wycorn has been brilliant since moving to Leicester on loan from Sunderland. Of course, Wycorn uh, scored the Tigers' goal. And a question for Steve from Jack. Do you think Scunthorpe will get relegated again? And what do you think of Nigel Adkins as a manager? Uh, I hope they don't. I I'm not quite sure they'll finish very much different to where they are on the table. And Nigel Adkins, well, he knows what it's going to take to start because obviously he's gone up, come back down, gone up again. So hopefully he's learnt from that experience. And like you said, their target is simple, it's survival. It is their brief at the start of the season will be to stay in that division. OK. Well, we've seen how three of the top four fared. Let's catch up then with West Brom, who started the day in second place and will have fancied a trip to a Sheffield Wednesday team who hadn't won in the last five games. It's taken Simon Cox a while to find his feet at West Brom, but the former Swindon striker is now beginning to justify his one and a half million pound transfer fee, taking his tally to four goals in as many games as Albion outclassed Wednesday to claim a fourth successive win. Having opened the scoring in the 23rd minute, the striker netted again seven minutes later when arriving at the back post to finish off Chris Brunt's cross to record the 50th league goal of his short career. By now the visitors were on the rampage and they added a third six minutes before half-time. Jerome Thomas exchanged passes with Cox before finishing well. With the point secure, Albion took their foot off the gas after the break, but they put the seal on an impressive display when Brunt slotted home a late fourth against his former club, choosing not to celebrate out of respect to the Wednesday fans. It was a bagger's 15th goal in the last four matches. I think we showed uh, a lot of character today and uh, we played really well and uh, I think we really um, we did how we finished off the game in the first half really. A military guard of honour for QPR and Coventry and it was the visitors who drew first blood. A free kick from on loan Chelsea man Patrick van Aalholt fell perfectly for Leon Best and a looping header gave the former Southampton striker his ninth goal of the season. QPR are building a reputation for playing quality football under Jim Magilton. A little bit like Arsenal, perhaps. Maybe that's why Jay Simpson looks so at home in West London. He's on loan from the Gunners, and his eighth goal of the campaign had Rangers level ten minutes before the interval. Midway through the second half, the Londoners took the lead. Coventry failed to clear their lines, and eventually the ball fell to fan favourite Akos Busaki. He took aim, and his shot took a cruel deflection off Richard Wood. But with nine minutes left, Wood rescued a point for the visitors, heading in Michael McIndoe's free kick. The defender is on loan from Sheffield Wednesday. No wonder Coventry want to make his move permanent. All in all, a valuable point for the visitors, who also survived some late drama when skipper Stephen Wright was shown a second yellow card by referee Michael Jones with six minutes remaining. Wright wasn't too happy about the decision, but throwing his captain's armband at the official might not have been the smartest thing to do, especially as the fourth official had a perfect view of the incident, unlike commentary manager Chris Coleman. With the sending off and, and the captain's armband being thrown at the referee, was that, was that not intentional? I, don't, I genuinely, I'm not sitting on the fence, didn't see that. I was trying to reshuffle the pack, we, you know, we don't attend men. Uh, so I can't comment on that. I'm, I understand right his, right his disappointment, he should have been sent off. It was a foul. No, it wasn't a second yellow, yeah, not for me. So I, I can't comment on that, I never saw it.
Palace's recent run of form continued after they saw off Watford, effectively beating the visitors in the opening six minutes. No player other than Darren Ambrose has scored for Neil Warnock's side since the first weekend of October. But just two minutes into this game, Victor Moses netted his first goal since March. Warnock was celebrating his 100th league game in charge of Palace and his mood was made even better four minutes later. Danny Butterfield spread the ball to Alan Lee who headed in to give Palace almost the perfect start. Watford did have a great chance to go in at half-time, still in the game though. Goal scorer Lee became the villain as he upended Henry Lansbury inside the box just before the end of the first half. But Julian Speroni pulled off a fine save to deny Danny Graham and keep Palace in control. And the victory was completed nine minutes after the restart when Ambrose made a bit of history with his 12th goal of the season. It was a sixth successive match in which he'd scored and he's the first Palace player to manage that since Ian Wright 20 years ago. I thought we deserved it, I thought we played well. We really could tell before the game we were right up for it and, uh, you know, Watford had done really well of late and uh, we had to really get amongst them and two cracking goals to start with and uh, set us on the way. Contrary to popular belief, Nottingham Forest are not named after Sherwood Forest, but from the Forest Recreation Ground where they originally played. They were founded in 1865 by a group of Shinty players. Do you know what that is, Ernie? It's a little bit like hurling, isn't it, from uh, Scotland? Very good. It's thought they were the first club to officially wear red. They're currently the only former European Cup winners playing outside the top flight of their domestic league. And did you know that the appointment of the man who made Forest Kings of Europe was triggered by local rivals Notts County, whose Boxing Day win at the city ground in 1974 led to the sacking of Brian Clough's predecessor, Alan Brown. What do you reckon, Brian? What? Oh, bloody rubbish! It's rubbish! Nothing rubbish about the way Forest are playing right now. Even old Big Ed would have enjoyed this thrashing of Doncaster, who fell behind on 18 minutes. Gareth Roberts deflecting Paul Anderson's drive into his own net. Just before the hour, they doubled their lead. Radoslav Majewski with the corner. Where's Morgan with one of those towering far post headers defenders live for? Rovers have yet to win away this season, and that wasn't going to change once Rob Earnshaw turned Doncaster keeper Neil Sullivan to stone to make it three 13 minutes from time, the Welshman's third of the season. They saved their best goal till last. Lewis McGugan had been on the pitch barely a minute when he finished from an impossible angle. An exclamation point on an impressive all-round team performance. Billy Sharp headed home a late consolation for Doncaster, but that's ten matches without defeat now for Forrest. After last season's relegation battle, Billy Davis now has them in the thick of the promotion picture. I felt that the first half we, we just sat off them too much and, you know, they're a good passing side, Doncaster. They certainly can move the ball around well. Second half, I felt that we showed our, our fitness levels. We worked really, really hard second half. Excellent fitness. First-class attitude, and, and we know that we've got a lot of goal threats in the side. Yeah, so a, a good, uh, good, good win for Nottingham Forest. I mean, they're doing fantastically well under Billy Davis, aren't they? Mm, there's one or two now that have started slowly. You think about Swansea, you think about Palace. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, Nottingham Forest certainly are very, very active in the summer. Ten in and ten out. Spent a lot of money. They're knocking on the door asking for Gareth Bale. So, you know, they're, they're an up upwardly mobile club. They've got a little bit of money to spend. And, uh, you know, they're spending it well. And Billy Davis has done a good job there. They're certainly the biggest movers of the day, it has to be said, uh, in yeah. terms of the league position. And um, that goal from Lewis McGugan, uh, Forrest fourth, it's a decent, decent goal. Uh, it, it was a decent goal. And I think what, what is of benefit to Forrest is that they've got... Uh, They've got a lot of options, haven't they, going forward? You know, we've seen them time and time again in recent weeks, and you know, they seem to share the goals around, and that's a good sign. Another good sign is they can afford to bring in a player of the ilk of Nicky Shorey on exactly. them, which is that's terrific. I mean, <laughs> these are premiership players. Uh, they paid 1.75 for, for Gunter. Um, so they're, they're punching their weight in the transfer market, and obviously their you know, wages aren't a problem either to them. You've been quite impressed with Crystal Palace, haven't they? And they're, they're slowly rising up that table. Yes, we don't want to incur the wrath of Neil, do we? But uh, they, they, you know, after a very, very slow start, they are now really clicking into gear, and you think that you know, they, they seem to be a pretty settled side. He seems to be reasonably comfortable with the way things are going. And in Dameron Ambrose, 
they've got someone who takes them out of the norm. Yeah, good point for Coventry QPR. Sheffield Wednesday, Brian Laws, you've got to be under a little bit of pressure. Well, um, finished 12th last year, and as I said, the brief before was to, to better that, um, you know, 19th position. That, that'll be a major disappointment so far for them. Yeah, I know Brian called it unacceptable, that defeat today. Right, let's go back to Lizzie, check in now with the latest on the emails and texts. It's been a very busy night. You guys have been working your mobiles and your computer keyboards. Now, earlier I asked you if you'd spotted a very young Premier League manager. It was, of course, Roberto Martinez. Not that many of you got in touch, though. Uh, Mark in Sheffield did. There you go. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, let's talk about uh, West Brom, because lots of you have been in touch as well. Emma says, West Brom were brilliant today, a class act, and Simon Cox is coming through. Rawdon says, well done, Roberto Di Matteo. We now have a team who score for fun and can defend. Tony Moby, are you watching? Pete says, give Di Matteo the freedom of West Brom. But Mikey, who calls himself an annoyed Sheffield Wednesday fan, says, today it was an absolute joke. I know West Brom are good, but you should never play like that, whoever you're up against. Now, we talked earlier about Neil Warnock asking me to talk more about Crystal Palace, so here we go. Craig says, I just want to say congratulations to Neil Warnock on his 100th game in charge of Palace today. Martin says, people don't realise just how much we've had to rely on youth and freebies. Well done, Warnock. Rod says, it was nice to see us playing the ball around and our striker Lee won 99% of the aerial balls, which made a big difference. James says, watch out, the Eagles are flying. But, um, actually I haven't got his name, but somebody else said to me, Lizzie, I challenge you to speak to Warnock the next time Palace lose 3-0. Something tells me he won't be complaining about the lack of attention then. I really don't want to talk to him if they lose 3-0. Uh, we've had lots of very happy Forest fans. Rob says, excellent result for Forest today. George says, watching as a Forest fan from the city ground amongst the Rovers fans was brilliant, but I would not like to do that if, uh, if, if the scoreline was the other way because that would be pretty horrible. Paul says, Billy Davis should be knighted. Finally, quick question for Steve. James says, we've had a, cr a cracking start to the season at Preston, but we've lost one player and that's made the whole season go downhill. How much of a difference can losing one player make to a team? Yeah, I mean, if that, if that player is integral and it is a big player in your side, you know, even, even at championship level, that, that can make a big difference. But especially when he's a decent defender. Yeah. Yeah, short and ledger, of course. All right, let's turn our attention to the other end of the table now. Starting with bottom of the table, Peterborough against the Middlesbrough side, who are still to taste a victory under Gordon Strachan. In fact, they've dropped seven positions since Strachan's arrival. Not quite what the fans and the chairman had in mind. Gordon Strachan and Mark Cooper were both left still looking for their first victories in charge of their respective clubs after this draw. The decision to bring in Dave Kitson on loan from Stoke does at least look like a good one by Strachan. The striker, who began his career at Posse's rivals Cambridge, opened the scoring. Cooper made a good decision of his own, naming George Boyd as his captain this week, and the skipper repaid his new manager by netting his 11th goal of the campaign. Middlesbrough have been creating the best openings with Leroy Leeter proving to be profligate, but they did regain their lead with Kitson on target for the 100th time in his league career. But yet again, Strachan was unable to lead his side to victory. Sean Batt did what bats do by turning things on its head with one of the goals of the day, something which possibly surprised the player himself. Batt was booked for his celebration, much to the annoyance of his manager. Middlesbrough thought they should have been given a chance to win the game in the dying moments as Aaron McLean appeared to trip Sean St. Ledger inside the Peterborough box. The former post defender and all of his teammates were incensed when the referee waved away the appeals. Four goals, lots of goal mouth action and a, and a fantastic goal to, to finish it off there to get us a point. The goal from Bat, it was a fantastic goal but he's now suspended for next weekend. Yeah, I mean, it's the craziest role in football. You know, a young lad scores a goal like that in front of a big crowd in the Championship and uh, he gets booked for celebrating. So uh, the people at UEFA got plenty to answer for for that. I've got a little bit of stick as an ex-Cambridge man, but um, I'm, I'm very, very, very happy to score. And I've never scored against Peterborough before, and I've got a weird little thing about trying to score against as many teams as possible, right. so I'm happy with that. Having recorded a first home win for 301 days last weekend, Reading were in good heart ahead of their visit to struggling Derby, but it was the home side who threatened first, Gary Teal stinging the palms of Aussie keeper Adam Federici in the Reading goal. The Royals had won their last five fixtures against Derby and probably thought they were on their way to number six when Gilfie Sigurdsson fired home via the post 11 minutes into the second half, the Icelanders' second goal in as many matches. But the lead lasted only four minutes. Teal finding space and time down the left to cross for Paul Green to stab home his second of the season from close range, although he probably didn't appreciate a body slam from Rob Hulse. 
Hulse would go on to deliver the knockout blow too. On 73 minutes, Teal's delightful back heel released Jay McEverly, whose inviting cross was converted by the big front man, his sixth of the season. Any hopes of a Reading comeback were probably doomed when a frustrated Shane Long, who thought he should have had a free kick for a foul by Sean Barker, then lunged in on Frederick Storr. The Irishman probably not surprised to receive the inevitable red card. Even then, the ten men nearly pinched something. Stephen Bywater coming to Derby's rescue to deny Alex Pierce and secure all three points for Nigel Clough's side. I thought we scored two fantastic goals today uh, and gave away uh, a soft one ourselves. Um, so we cut that out uh, and we just get, stick to our scoring, we'll be all right. If ever there appeared to be a home banker, this was it. Bristol City were unbeaten at Ashton Gate since last December. That's 19 league games. United hadn't won on the road since mid-September. But City found themselves right up against it after Darius Anderson scored twice in the space of three first-half minutes. His first was given in spite of a flag for offside. He then latched onto a pass from Jamie Ward for the second. It was the fourth time he'd managed a double in his last eight games. And there was more to come in a remarkable finale. Gary Johnson is known to be able to get a lot out of his team with his man management skills, and he needed to be at his very best to claw this game back. He was helped by Lewis Carey's goal early in the second half as he turned in Paul Hartley's cross. All the huffing and puffing from the home side appeared to be coming to nothing until five minutes into injury time when Alvaro Saborio appeared to have kept City's home record intact as they looked to go a step closer to matching a club record of 25 home league games without defeat done back in 1954. But hopes of reaching that were dashed as the Blades responded immediately, regaining the lead just 17 seconds after City had equalised. City's defence switched off, possibly thinking that the job had been done, allowing Henderson to complete his hat-trick when he produced a cool finish. It was his 11th goal of the season, and there will be few more important. I know one of the first questions would be, well, we've let in another goal in the 96th minute or something, and uh, I can't give you an answer right, right this minute. You saw the emotions of so many people go up and down inside a minute. It was just unbelievable. But only football can do that. To say they were suffering a drenching in Devon was an understatement. A rain dance failed to dispel the downpour, but Plymouth fans probably felt like doing their best Gene Kelly impressions, singing in the rain as Carl Duguid opened the scoring inside the first ten minutes. But instead it provoked a flood of goals in the other direction. It all started on 12 minutes, Daniel Bogdanovich heading in Adam Hamill's cross, his third goal in four matches. Four minutes later, the visitors were in front. Perhaps Iceland's Emil Holfredson is at home in these conditions, or maybe he just had a lot of help from Plymouth defenders. With Argyle getting that sinking feeling, Barnsley poured forward in search of more. Number three came on 24 minutes, Hamill lashing one home from a tight angle. And as the deluge continued, so did Barnsley's thirst for goals. The fourth, just past the half-hour, came from Ryan Shotton on loan from Stoke, his first for the club, or so he thought. After an hour, and with no sign of a break in the weather, referee Gavin Ward decided to call a halt to proceedings, leaving a stunned Barnsley boss Mark Robbins feeling thoroughly washed out. I'm angry because the... Uh... You know, the decision was made unilaterally. There was, no, there was absolutely no sign that he was going to do that. And he just blew his whistle and called it off. But, you know, something we have to live with. I think um, we feel aggrieved for that reason. Um, we feel aggrieved because we were out of sight in the game. And it's disappointing because, you know, people have travelled a long way. They've spent hard and money um, to see the team win away. Uh, I'd be gutted as a, as a manager after the, you know, the result. But it's a huge yoke for us. The boot had been on the other foot. Do you think you'd agreed with the referee's decision? If the boot was on the other foot, I don't think that decision would have been made. I clearly unimpressed Mark Robbins. Do you sympathise with him there, Steve? Oh, you, you can't but. I mean, I, th th I think there should be a rule that change. I think they should go back down there. 4-1, what was it, 30, 31 58 minutes, minutes? 58 minutes, yes, so you've got 32 minutes left. And it should repl be replayed from that. I know that you've got the ticket allocation. I know you've got the, the, the game again. But that's, that's Barnsley. That isn't just down the road. That's a million miles from Plymouth. That's an awful long way to go. 
And I think, you know, at 4 1 up, the game is dead and buried. In effect, it's their game. He was clearly speaking through frustration when he said if the, if the boot was on the other foot, maybe the, the referee yeah. might not have called it off. But um, Peter was celebrating their first point under Mark Cooper. Yep. Uh, and terrific second goal from Sean Batty. Yeah, a marvellous goal, wasn't it? I mean, it's just, just one of those where you, know, you think you know where the goal is, so I'll turn and <laughs> I'll just hit that. Um, and as you say, it's, it's a brilliant strike. Unfortunately, he gets, uh, gets a booking for his celebrations and I think he gets a suspension but I think they might have considered themselves a tad lucky because it was definitely a penalty uh, uh, that, that they should have conceded late in that game. Yeah, more frustration for Gordon Strachan still looking for his first win at Middlesbrough. Was this a penalty? Uh, Sean St. Ledger, who we've spoken about already, you've said it just now. <laughs> was it was it fairly clear cut, wasn't it? Oh, come on. I mean, there's, there's very little... Uh, oh. <laughs> What's that a penalty? I don't really think you need no, me to answer no. that one, do you? I just thought we could see it again, no, just to I, prove the point. I think Mark, Mark will be pleased that uh, yeah, that, that one wasn't, wasn't uh, there was no video technology for yeah. that one. Uh, dare I say, there might be uh, one or two um, Barnsley fans texting or emailing through. I don't know, I'm, I'm sure that will have been the case. Now, uh, it being FA Cup weekend, there meant there was just one game outside the Championship. That was between two struggling sides in League Two. Macclesfield were taking on Grimsby, who of course were languishing in the drop zone. A goalless draw at Macclesfield might not feel like it was worth waiting up for, but then Grimsby provided an entertaining game, not only by the quality of the finishing. Colin Daniels' free kick hit the upright for the home side before Grimsby, without a win in their last ten league games, struck the bar. Both sides had plenty of chances to take all the points. This was hardly the classiest move of the match, with the ball bobbing about in the box, but when it fell to Adam Proudlock, he was only inches away from the winner as his effort rebounded off the post. Uh, incidentally, that result means there's no change at the bottom of League Two. And by the way, a reminder, there are plenty of midweek games in the Football League next week, and you'll be able to see all the highlights of those games on the BBC Football website. Now, I touched on it a little earlier. I should think there'll be one or two Barnsley fans emailing, texting through. So, Lizzie, what have you got for us? They started this afternoon, as soon as the match was, uh, was abandoned. We've got so many, it's all going to be about Plymouth Barnsley. Ian says it just isn't fair play. Dave says it's another island. And Ryan says it feels worse than a defeat because it's so long since we scored four goals away from home. Lots of suggestions as to how it should have been dealt with. David says the football bodies have got to do something about it. Couldn't they have waited for the groundsman to work on the pitch or for the, the water to subside? Mark says Barnsley could stay in Plymouth until Monday and play the second half then. Lots of you think the replay should be uh, uh, just half an hour and start at 4-1. Several of you also raising the question of whether this should have happened to Manchester United. Interesting. Understandably, many of you are upset about the amount of money that you've wasted. I've got to say hello to Jim. He went there from Aberdeen and Boothie stuck in a hotel room. £250 the poorer. Scott sent this photo of the pitch 10 minutes after the game. Looks okay there, but our reporter said the heavens open soon after that. I've got a statement from the referee. He says, uh, I have to look at the players safety there was a lot of surface water on it we started the second half it was only getting worse and I had to abandon it interestingly the rules say if a game is abandoned after 89 minutes the replay is still nil nil Thomas they want to cheer you up saying don't forget that we can actually win 4-1 so it's got to be a good thing thanks for all those texts and emails and keep them coming in next week thanks very much Lizzie so before we go a quick check then at how things stand in the championship well it's Newcastle who stay top two points ahead of West Brom but there's a gap now opening between the top two and third place, Leicester, of course, drop points. Six points now, the difference. Nottingham Forest, the big movers of the day, they've gone up five places to go up to fourth on 29, with QPR and Swansea both on 28. In fact, apart from the top two, Forest and Crystal Palace, the only two winners in the top half of the table. While at the bottom, Peterborough stay at the foot on 12 points, the first under Mark Cooper. Uh, but, of course, Ipswich and Plymouth, for varying reasons, have got a game in hand. The two sides who did win in the bottom half were Sheffield United and Derby County. Well, that's it for tonight. We're back on Wednesday night for highlights of the Carling Cup quarterfinals. We get underway at quarter past 11 on BBC One. And don't forget to see the championship goals again. We're on the red button right now till midday on satellite and cable, although you'll have to wait till the morning to catch us on Freeview. But we are on the iPlayer all week with goals on the BBC Football website. Don't forget to join Adrian for Match of the Day 2 on Sunday night, half past ten on two. My thanks as always to Lizzie and to Steve. We'll see you on Wednesday night from all of us. Good night.